Coming up on Theater Talk. My father, he was making a movie with Margaret O'Brien when I was a little girl. <laughs> I was around seven or eight. It was in the summertime. <laughs> and I used to uh, rehearse in the car with my dad. I would, do, I would read mm -hmm. the lines. And he'd made the mistake of saying to me, oh, honey, you do that every bit as good as Mark. <laughs> right? Oh. So then I'd get to the studio and watch them, right. you know, rehearsing the scene that we'd worked on in the car. <laughs> and I remember praying that she just dropped dead. <laughs> <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation and the Honorable Thomas Mercer Ray. York City. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, last summer, Susan, I went to East Hampton and uh, I saw a play that I was really quite taken with called uh, Clever Little Lies, written by Joe DiPietro, who's been a guest on Theater Talk before, and starring an actress who has always been one of my favorites, the great Marlo Thomas. And I remember writing about the play in my column mm -hmm. and sort of urging it to producers to pick it up and bring it to New York. And indeed, yes, I do believe are. you are about to open yes, at the West Side Theater. So I, you owe it all to me. I we do. do. I do. I owe <laughs> everything to you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. We got, now that we've got that out of the way. Well, uh, I was really quite taken with this play, Joe, because it, it begins as a comedy, but it shifts yeah. along the way. And I'm curious to know, for people who haven't seen it, if you can give us a sense of what it's about and and what got you thinking about it. What was the yeah. idea for it? Well, it's really about uh, Marlowe plays a mother who uh, husbands comes home from a tennis match with his son and she realizes that the son told uh, her husband something uh, really bad. And, but the husband has uh, sworn to secrecy and won't tell her what it is. So uh, Marlo's character, Alice, invites the son and uh, his wife, and they just had a baby, over for dinner. And she basically, with the idea, she wants to pull this out whatever it is and find out and hopefully solve it. This is not a spoiler because it happens in the first scene. The son had confessed an infidelity to his dad. Right. As the play progresses, a lot of revelations about the family and who and who's telling the truth and, you know, the lies that we use in any relationship to keep it going mm -hmm. um, is sort of what the play is about. But it started with, I've always been fascinated because infidelity is one of the bedrocks of comedy, especially mm -hmm. on stage. Every yep. farce is based... Sex farces are... Yeah, yeah. they're based on infidelities. Uh, but in real life, infidelities tend to have a lot of consequences and a lot of painful consequences. So I thought, ooh, can you write a play where it starts out funny and you think, oh, this is going to be this sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, light, you know, really, you know, fun comedy about infidelity. But then at one point, pull the rug out from under the uh, audience's uh, feet and say, ooh, this is actually has consequences. Now, as soon as you read this play, you think, I want to I want to do this part. When I was reading it, I thought, oh, I know. I, I know this play. I know where this is going. Right. And so, you know, I was reading it and enjoying it. It's very, very funny. And then all of a sudden, it was like, whoa. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was going to go there. And then I thought, oh. And then it was, wait a minute. It's going here? So it went so <laughs> many different places that, it, you know, it's, it's inescapable. You want to do something that takes you on that kind of roller coaster and the audience, too. I mean, the audience does things like, ah! Oh, I did. <laughs> well, also, though, it's because, because, you know, I mean, you know, you're a, 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 it's a terrible word, but you're kind of an iconic person in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. And we think of the, the Marlo Thomas image, yeah. which is how the play begins. But then it all cracks. <laughs> well, also, little, I should hope so. I don't want an image. <laughs> also, uh, I was going to ask you about that, though. I mean, isn't it fun uh, to not be cast as Marlo Thomas? Uh, well, you know, I never thought I was cast as Marlo Thomas. You know, when, we, when we did that girl... A year into the That Girl show, the ABC wanted to rename it the Marlo Thomas show, <laughs> the Dick Van Dyke show, the Mary Tyler Marshall, whatever, the Carol Burnett show. I said, no, I don't want, this is not the Marlo Thomas show. If I did the Marlo Thomas show, it would be a lot weirder than this. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it would be called Clever Little Lies. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I never wanted to have anything called the Marlo Thomas show. Mm -hmm. And I never think of myself as being iconic or having an image to it. Um, I but, mean, certainly Virginia Woolf is... Uh, which I you guess, did. Up which I did, right. And uh, Six Degrees of Separation, which I did the national tour of. So I don't see myself as, as, as a thing, as a particular But Marlo, brand. I think of you as a feminist hero. And uh, do you think of yourself as a feminist? 
Oh, yes, of yes, course. Of course. So I don't know what the hero kind of part, but I <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of interesting how this, this play jives with your, your feminist perspective. Yes. Well, I, I mean, I, Joe, Joe writes great women. I mean, he, he just really does. And, uh, and that's another thing. Everything that this woman does comes from a place of intelligence. Mm-hmm. It's not a falling down silly woman. She's a modern woman. She's a businesswoman. Mm-hmm. She's in control of her family. She's very astute about her husband. She knows right away when she's lying, when he's lying. I mean, the audience loves that she says, all right, what's wrong? Yeah, she yeah. knows right off that he's lying. And she's going to find out what it is. And he is trying to hold back. And she digs it out and digs it out until finally she says, I know what it is. But once she finds out what it is, which everybody loves that she does that, then in order to save her son, she sacrifices herself. And that, to me, is what's the most moving thing about this play. I, I really find that that's what mothers do. Hmm. You know, they, they, they'll do anything for their children. You know, I work for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And you see the parents come there, and I don't want to turn this into a thing for St. Jude, but parents will do anything to make their child well. They'll sell their house, they'll mortgage their lives, they'll quit their jobs, whatever it takes to get their kid well. Mm -hmm. And that's what parents do, and that's what this woman is doing. There's a, uh, sorry. She'll do anything. Yeah. To put her her son back on track. I mean, I saw the play over a year ago now, but I'm and I, we don't want to give things away, but I'm still haunted by the final scene mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. her going up yeah. the stairs because you realize these lives are never going to be the same again. Right. Right. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very much a play about marriage and relationships that we all sort of go through, and you know, everyone's dealt with infidelity, if not actually happened. We've sort of everyone's considered it. Everyone's we've had our suspicions. By it. We've had our suspicions. And your friends whose and your lives friends. are falling apart. Right. I know friends who have confessed to me, you know, really things and then you have to go out with them and their spouse and pretend like you've never heard it. The role of the eyes of recognition. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, right. And you're sitting there at dinner like, no, yeah, 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 yeah. And you're like, I don't want to say anything wrong. I know. I know. But your play does bring up the very interesting moral choice that we all yeah. often deal with if, if, you, if you know about an infidelity, mm-hmm. right. are you going to tell the Absolutely. The wounded party. Yeah. That and, there's right. Infidelity. And there's another great thing, too, that Greg says at what point. Uh, Greg is who? Uh, Greg Malaby, who's such a great actor and plays the husband, and you yeah. loved him. I yeah, remember. he was, he was true. He's just wonderful. He's, he's got everything. He's, he's, he's got the meat. He's got the comic chops. Mm-hmm. He's, he's just a thrill to play with. But he has a line in the play where he says, you could have stopped it. There was a time when you could have stopped it. Right. And that's true. Mm-hmm. We've all been there. Mm-hmm. Where there's some, there's a temptation of something, and and there's a moment when you say to yourself, "No, I'm, I'm not, not going, going to do this because I don't want to give up all this, this that I built right. with somebody else." Right. And you and 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 he's the way he says that. He says there was a time you could have stopped it, and I, I think that's a very intelligent. I, you know, comedy is so precious. Really, I just I love it so. Mm-hmm. I grew up with comedy, mm-hmm. and I've always loved. My dad used to say to me, "The audience will follow you anywhere if you don't lie to them." You know, just don't get off the yellow brick road for a cheap laugh. Mm. Just stay with the truth. And that's what Joe has done. He's, he's written it in a way that we, if we follow that path, you know, we're telling the truth all the way. We're not always telling the truth to ourselves, but we're telling the truth as we know it all the way. And that's very important in a comedy. So you're reminding me, of course, because I grew up on the Danny Thomas show, your father's situation comedy <laughs> about a family and then you were obviously you were being played by somebody else and you were a kid were you there watching that in your youth going i'm going to be an actress and i'm going to get in there and why, why does she have my part i should be playing that <laughs> exactly, part it's my dad exactly. <laughs> actually it started way earlier than that my father took me to uh, uh he was making a movie with margaret o'brien when i was a little girl i was around seven or eight it was in the summertime and i loved going to the studio i mean imagine being a little girl sitting at a commissary with one one man's dressed as an Indian, one man's dressed as a pirate. <laughs> it really you know, was like that. I mean, it was just so great in those <laughs> days. Like because now they, yeah, now they go off on location, but in those days, everything was shot in the back lot. Right. Yeah, so right. it was just such a magic land. And, mm-hmm. and my father was not a hoverer like my mother. So I, once he'd go into makeup, I'd run all over the lot and look at Cary Grant and whoever the heck was there. <laughs> it was just so much fun. And I used to uh, rehearse in the car with my dad. I would, do, I would read mm-hmm. the lines. Mm. And he made the mistake of saying to me, oh, honey, you do that every bit as good as Mark. <laughs> right? Uh-oh. So then I'd get to the studio and watch them, right. you know, rehearsing the scene that we'd worked on in the car. <laughs> and I remember praying that she just dropped dead. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of my wonderful <laughs> <laughs> That's a 
the most <laughs> honest description <laughs> I've ever heard of wanting to be in a show. Wanting to be in show. Wishing Margaret O'Brien. Margaret O'Brien. And then somebody would say, "Does anybody, any girl here, know this part?" <laughs> like Shirley MacLaine, right? <laughs> <laughs> what did your uh, what did, you, did did your father encourage your interest in acting, or was it like I'm in showbiz, I want you to be something else? Oh yeah, no, no, he didn't want any of us to be. He didn't. No, because no. we were all in school, and he said to me when I said I wanted to be, he saw me at a play at USC, and he said to my mother, "Oh my God, she's got the bug. What are we gonna do?" <laughs> and uh, he insisted that I graduate as a teacher, as an English teacher. Hmm. We all had to have a degree, uh, so we'd have something to fall back on. And um, I, yeah, and the minute I got my degree, I put it on the table and said, "I'm going to New York to study with Lee Strasberg. I'm out of here. That's for you. I'm out." Did he give you any support when you were uh, when you came to New York? I mean, did he help you out financially? It was like if you yes. wanted this, you got to be on your own. You got to no, take no, regular no. No, jobs. He, and he, he, he was help. he was very frightened of my getting hurt in any way or run over by a car or or get kidnapped or, you know, <laughs> mugged or whatever. No, he, once I said I wanted to do it uh, and, and studied, uh, uh, he was very much behind me. My, my big break was when Mike Nichols uh, put me in Barefoot in the Park in London and right. my father came, my mother and father came. And uh, I'll never forget it, he came back to the dressing room and, uh, and he'd been against it for so long and he came back and he had this look on his face. My mother was like, oh, darling! This is so wonderful and everything. And my father came in. He looked like he had done the entire show with me. He was completely drained. He <laughs> sat down in the chair like a drug addict. You know? <laughs> and, I, and what I saw on his face was just relief. That you could uh, do it. That I could do it. Right. And, and then you didn't was. have to worry about you anymore. No, you were going to make it on your yeah. own. Yeah. And, and Marlo still in rehearsal quotes her father about, you know, timing and, and right. lessons learned. And right. Stuff. Oh, what sort right. of things? Can you give us a little insight? Well, into like you? I said before yeah. about honesty. You know, he was very big on that, that you don't, you know, if you read a line and it just doesn't feel true, and, and, and there's no play in the world, including Virginia Woolf, where some line isn't true. Right. And the great thing about Joe is you say, you know, Joe, I feel that this isn't really where, I, where the she is at this moment, and he'll look at it and rework it or give it to somebody else and say, maybe this is Greg's line and not the mom's line. You know, so we really have worked it through, and that's what's so great about doing a new play. Yeah. You know, people always say, what, what play do you wish you could do? I want to do a new play. <laughs> it's much more fun right. because it's, it really is like, like being a pioneer. Yeah. You know? And do you, when, you, when you're working with mm -hmm. someone who's got a, a strong personality, as talented as she is, do you begin to hear her voice in the character? Oh, absolutely. shifts the way you even thought about the character? Yeah, absolutely. Because actually the first person I gave this play to was David Saint, who is our director right. and runs George Street Playhouse. And he immediately called me up. He read it right away. He immediately called me up and said, what about Marlo Thomas for this? And I'm like... Well, she's perfect. I don't know her. Do you know her? He goes, yeah, I know her. I know her. So, um, uh, and he said that before he even told me if he liked the play or not. So I was like, oh, sure, give it to her. So uh, you gave it to her right away. And then we did a reading at Marlo's uh, apartment right. to just to sort of hear it out loud. And then as soon as I heard her do it, and she clearly keyed into it, and I thought like, please say yes. Please do this because I, I know how to write. I think we can, I know how to write this for exactly for you. And, um, and that's what we did. And then yeah. went back and tailored things for... Oh, absolutely. And especially in rehearsal when, we, you know, we sat around the table for a week and, and really did it. So absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Marlo's... I mean, obviously her comic timing is so exquisite that, you know, I'd be a fool not to and stuff. Well, we were talking earlier in the green room about this whole issue of comic timing. And, and I think we all agree, you can't really teach it, right? I mean, no. you had it with your father, I guess, so you inherited it or you just had it around the house. My whole family has it. Really? Your my mother, too? My sister and brother, my mo everybody. They're all just hilarious. They can tell a story. Mm. Right. You know? And I, in fact, when I went to study with Lee Strasberg, my father said to me, because he was against my going and all that, and he said, when they do, a, you know, call me when they do the comedy timing class. I want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Did Lee Strasberg do a comedy timing No. Well, <laughs> oh, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> He was a comedian, my father. <laughs> Only you can actor. bet. Uh, he's yes, an actor, too. He was you can bet now in pretentious acting schools they do have comedy time, right. time in class. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm just guessing. I'm they not probably even convinced in that acting schools are necessarily <laughs> I think smart. most of the actors I know you just learn by doing a play right. in front well, of people yeah. and seeing how you Well, you tell that to all those yeah. graduates of, of RADA we've had on this show. Anyway, we move on. <laughs> but, 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 I think but, it's great to yeah. study. But if you want to see... Uh, how comedy timing is, you know, <laughs> internal or not, is write a new play, 
go to an audition, see someone come in and read a scene and be hysterical and everyone behind the table laughs. Then the person, another person comes in, reads the exact same scene and it's just, as a writer, you want to kill yourself because mm-hmm. you think this is the least funny thing ever written. And you think, I'm, the, I'm to blame now. I totally I'm... blame myself. Yeah, I totally blame <laughs> myself. And I'm like, oh. And then, you know, someone comes in and they just nails it and you're like, this is delightful. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it's a really great lesson. <laughs> well, if you want to see Comic Timey, but also something that uh, will kind of break your heart in the end, don't miss Marlo Thomas in Clever Little Lies at the West Side Theater, written by Joe DiPietro. Uh, I wish you a long and successful Thank you. Thank you. And And Greg Malavy, too, who's so wonderful. And who are the other actors? Uh, Kate Weatherhead and George Merrick. Right. Okay. Well, don't miss it. Uh, Clever Little Eyes at the West Side Theater. Thank you very much for being our guest tonight. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look at me calling it so important. It says unknown. How important is unknown? And you got phone now, Mom. Hello. Hello. This is Billy's mother. Not in the family time. And you can't take any work calls now. Here, here, turn it off. Turn it off! All right, all right, look, it's off, it's off. My iPhone is off. Shit, it's my Blackberry. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh guys, you keep them way off balance. How can they spot? You got no talents. Razzle dazzle um. Razzle dazzle um. Razzle dazzle um. And he'll make you a star. Joining me again is my substitute co-host. Am I still here? Jesse. <laughs> Why am I still here? We're here we're Where is Michael Riedel? Michael Riedel is in the seat across from you, and we are going to continue to talk about Michael Riedel's blockbuster from Simon & Schuster, Razzle Dazzle, The Battle for Broadway. Joining Michael Riedel is Albert Poland, producer, writer, general manager, bon vivant, and the only man in the theater. And, and, and one of the stars of my book. One of the must. stars of his book. I wanted to tell you that Albert was the, um, uh, as we were discussing the other week about this book, Albert was the very first person I interviewed. And I don't think he knows this, but when I signed the contract for the book, I thought, oh my God, how do I, how the hell do I do a book? I mean, I've written columns my whole life, but they're 750 words. And I always thought as a writer, I'm a sprinter, not a runner. Unlike you, you know, you could write those long arts and leisure pieces that went on forever. Uh, Why, thank they you. Were, they were great. They were great. Um, but, you know, I'm not really that kind of a writer. You know, I'm a Walter Winchell, you know, da 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 that kind of thing. And so I was really struggling to think, how, how do I write a book? I had no idea how to write a book. And uh, the very first person I interviewed was Albert, and I went up to him to talk to him about Bernie Jacobs and Jerry Schoenfeld, who are key players because they saved the Schubert organization in this book. And as soon as Albert started telling me these stories in his theatrical, colorful way, he remembers everything, and he's a great raconteur. As soon as that interview was over with, I knew I could write that book because I thought all I have to do is interview people like Albert, take down their stories, and the narrative is going to unfold. And indeed, I was blessed with interviewing all the great theater people, Liz McCann, but beyond that, Michael, you were able to get us to talk. You got people to talk. Oh, I don't think that was very so hard. Great. <laughs> but, well, but, you know, they, but they're theatrical characters, so they're inherently theatrical. But I also realized, as I was putting the book together, that I, I was able to do it at the right time because enough time has gone by that people can reflect right, right. on their lives and the business. And they can speak openly. They can speak candidly about things that they probably would not have been able to talk about several years ago. But enough, but, but not too much time has gone by that everybody's dead. <laughs> so there were people I could interview. Well, one, one of the things that I really enjoyed about the book was the way you make your historical argument about the, the centrality of theater in the, uh, in the Renaissance of New York, if you will, uh, through uh, wonderful characters, as you've said, but also through individual shows that uh, actually did change the fortunes of a uh, of the Schubert organization and other producing organizations and theater owners, and thereby change the city. Uh, but in particular, it's some of those characters. And you, you, we were talking earlier about Michael Bennett, uh, who, who plays a big role in this book, partly because of a chorus line, which, of course, turned the tide for the Schubert organization, mm-hmm. but also because uh, in the book you really detail, for the first time I've ever read, a uh, kind of uh, moving and tragic relationship between uh, him and... Uh, oh, Bernie Jacobs. Between, yeah, Bernie Jacobs. Between well, Albert, Bernie. you lived through it. I mean, Bernie really thought of Michael as a son. Yes, right? yes. What do you think? Why do you think that was? Oh, I think... I just think they had a, an affinity for each other's excellence, mm-hmm. you know, and they were both very talented people. Uh, 
Bernie loved talent, yeah. you know. But they were from very dis similar spheres of life, mm -hmm. would you say? And then Michael Bennett, because I'm, I'm, I'm fortunately obliged to push this along in this fascinating book, that Michael Bennett, who became the great genius of Broadway, was a casualty of both his drug addiction and the AIDS Epidemic, yes. and and so the, I, and you, Michael, I, you described yeah. this so. But I, I think to understand the relationship between Bernie and Michael, which was a very key relationship in the history of this time that I'm telling. You know, Michael came from um, a poor Italian family from Buffalo. His father was a very low-level mobster, always in hock to the mob up in Buffalo. It was not a happy family environment at all, and uh, he got out of there as a teenager. He just one day. Picked up and left. He left high, closed the locker, left high school, and came to New York and auditioned for a European tour of West Side Story and got it. And Michael, because he had a family that he really didn't care for, as he came up through the ranks, he began to assemble his own family. So Bob Avian became the older brother. John Brelio, his lawyer, became the younger brother. Anna right. McKechnie became sister and wife. Figure that one out. She never could. <laughs> but what was missing was dad. And Bernie Jacobs became the father because Bernie had the power. Bernie had the theaters. As Manny Eisenberg said, Bernie and Michael were both hustlers in their own way. And they, they hustled each other. You know, Michael wanted the money. He wanted the theaters. Bernie wanted the talent. And Manny said, in the process of hustling each other, they fell in love with each other. Yes. And that became the bond. But I mean, it, it came, to the point, came to the point where, as many people say in the book, if you said, uh, have you seen Trevor Nunn's Hamlet? Bernie would say, Michael Bennett's Hamlet would be infinitely better. And if you, anybody came between Bernie and Michael, Bernie would destroy them or threaten it's, it's them. A, it's very moving, particularly because what finally happened in a way was that Michael came between Michael and Bernie. Exactly. And Michael wanted to become a mogul in his own right. And it wasn't enough that he was the most successful director in the world or they had his own um, theatrical empire, 890 Broadway. What he wanted, and if you're in the theater, this is the important thing to have, is to own the theater. That gives you the real power and the real control. That's why the Schubert's are so powerful. That's why Jimmy Niederland are so powerful, because they control the real estate. And Michael wanted his own theater. And he secretly tried to buy half of the Mark Hellinger and go into partnership with Jimmy Niederlander, who was the Schubert's rival. And he was very close to signing a deal to do that. But Bernie, who had a great gossip vine, heard about it. And uh, Brelio, John Brelio, the lawyer, tells me this in the book. They were waiting for Michael to come in to sign the papers to take half of the Hellinger. And they waited and waited, and finally Michael shows up totally strung out on something. Well, see, that I mean, not to interrupt you, but he was also going mad on drugs at this point. Well, yeah, that he really that problem. guided his behavior. Well, and then he took Brelio aside and he said, he won't let me do it. Oh. He won't let me do it. Meaning that that night, Bernie had gotten inside of his head and was going to, it was never, Bernie Jacobs was never going to allow Michael Bennett to have a partnership with Jimmy. Okay, Michael, there's your screenplay. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, it's, 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 moment, coming. <laughs> it's moments like that that really make the book. Uh, but uh, I also want to point out that the, uh, the Schuberts, or the, the, who, the people who became known as the Schuberts, uh, when the theaters were renamed for them, the Plymouth and the Royale were named for Jerry Schoenfeld and for Bernie Jacobs, a lot of us, including myself in the theater community, who didn't know them and didn't know this history were all kind of miffed, like, like why are they naming them after lawyers? Themselves, yeah. yeah. And when, when, uh, when uh, Oscar Hammerstein doesn't have uh, a theater named after him or Jerome Kern or, uh, you know, Edward Albee for that matter. Um, but reading the book, you begin to see how there's some justice in their having uh, been given those honors. I wanted to ask you, Elva, what did you think when, when they announced they were going to name the theaters after themselves? How did you feel about that? Because Jerry took a lot of flack for it. I was very happy. I, I was a little shaky about it. I, I, I thought of Arthur Miller and, you know, Tennessee Williams and a few of these people. <laughs> Minor but, characters. But I think, as, as I said, I think they have become larger with time. And I agree with Jesse. I think I think it is. An, it reached a point where you can see that it was richly earned. You know, they did not telegraph everything that they were doing. We have simply just become aware of it. Right. You know, and your book is a huge help in that direction. I thought I talked to Jerry about renaming the theaters, and I had suggested to him. I said, you know, Jerry, you are going to take some flack for this. I said, if I were you, I would rename the theater after Bernie, because I don't think anyone's Bernie was dead, and no one's going to object to that. And Bernie was a beloved figure. 
Uh, and I said, and, and you know, Jerry, you'll be the one who's standing out there on the podium and you'll be quoted and you'll be talking about it. But um, it was Pat Schoenfeld, Jerry's wife, who said to the board of directors of the Schubert organization, if you name one after Bernie, you have to name one after Jerry. <laughs> and indeed, Jerry took the predictable hits. You know, there was even, I think, a big Charles Isherwood piece in the New York Times making fun of him. I saw how much pain Jerry was in yes. when he was being attacked like that. And I mean, I hadn't thought about writing a book about at the time, but I did know what their accomplishments were. So I did defend him no, it for just, doing it, that. It felt like to the, the person on the street, such as myself, that it, it lacked humility since he was still living to name a theater after yourself. You have to live with that. That's going to come. I was sitting in Frankie and Johnny uh, the night of the dedication of the theaters. Marley Safer was at the next table with <laughs> the Conickies. <laughs> and the marquee for the Schoenfeld went on, and Marley Saver said, should have called it the Jerry, would have saved electricity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank yes, you, Michael. Saying, the book is from Simon & Schuster. The book is called Razzle Dazzle from Simon & Schuster. Got Here, it. I'll do it. Let me do it. Whoa. Let me do it. All right, the book is Razzle Dazzle, <laughs> The Battle for Broadway uh, by Michael Riedel, out from Simon & Schuster, a terrific book. Get it on Amazon, get it at Barnes & Noble. Drive this one on the bestseller list. I've read the book. It's a blockbuster. <laughs> Jesse Green, fantastic to have you here. Why, thank you, Susan. Did I do anything? You were fabulous. <laughs> we'll have you back. As it's great Michael to have a guest substitute. who's so mellifluous in his, the way he describes his book. <laughs> you said it. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.